What a beautiful morning to gather together to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Indeed, this, uh, all the many blessings that come from the Father, the Father of lights. What, one, what, a, what a marvelous existence, existence, life it is to be adopted by the Father in obedience to his commands, in obedience to uh, his plan of salvation, belief in Jesus Christ, and, uh, and living according to that faith. This morning I'd like to talk about right relationships in Christ. Right relationships in Christ. You know, um, in Matthew 25, 23, Jesus was giving instructions about what is, what sh how should one, what should one's attitude be and how should he deal with issues in his life when he's uh, regarding he and his brethren. Look at uh, Matthew 25. Um, I'm sorry, 20, not, not 25, but rather 5, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 23. To, to set the, the, the thought, let us, um, beginning 22, Jesus speaking, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka, or worthless, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall in bain, be danger of hell fire. So we see that there is a, a, a certain attitude that, that uh, Christ is condemning between one man and another who condemns his brother. Uh, and he goes and says, verse 23, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath sought hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way first, be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So as we consider, when they were instructed to bring their, their sacrifices to the altar, to ha to, to before God, in, in worshiping him, according to the commandments that he had given them, we see that the attitude of that individual was, was paramount. That before we can uh, appropriately, properly offer, they were, that were, rather, they, before they were able to properly and appropriately offer their sacrifices, they had to write, have the right attitude. They had to have all relationships clear. It says, go settle things with your brother. Then, when you can, set, when you can offer your sacrifice, it can be offered with a clear conscience. Now, as we consider that God, having called us out of sin, to bask in his marvelous light, that he has desired to have a relation, closer relationship with us, you know, it is he who who reconciled us through his son, Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 2, 9, Peter is reminding them who they were. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that is, a people for God's own possession, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what God has done. He's called us out of the darkness of this world, the darkness of our sin, into his marvelous light. And God wants us to grow in, and to mature in our spiritual life. As we see in 1 Peter 2, 1, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. His desire is that we should grow spiritually, and to do so we should desire and feed on that sincere milk of the word that which uh, provides his nutritional value, spiritually speaking, his word. Also in 2 Peter 3.18, uh, we're instructed to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We should grow in grace, how? In the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. To do so, we must let go of sin and the things that hinder us. Consider the runner who, who is perhaps in the Olympic Games. What does he do as he trains so many long, hard hours? He, he uh, sheds all those things that would hinder him from running efficiently and fast. In Hebrews 12, 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and, dis, uh, and the sin which doth, doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. As we run that Christian race, we should have a, a mindset that we will continue on. We will we'll go forth. We'll be steadfast. We'll have tenacity in our, and stick to it in our, in our race for that goal, for the gold which is not 
earthly gold, which, which corrupts, it rusts away and is stolen, but rather that gold, that treasure, which is found in heaven. Now, sometimes there are things we just want to hold on to. After obeying the gospel, we have repented of our, our sins. Sometimes, though, there are just some things we want to hold on to. We need to identify these things. We need to be willing to let go of them. In Matthew 5, verses 29 and 30, consider what Jesus said about entering into heaven. In verse 29 of Matthew 5, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee, for it is, a, it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and, that, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. In verse 30, And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Now, he's not talking about um, um, destroying the body, uh, self-destruction. He's just saying if there's anything as important as perhaps your right eye or your right hand or very valuable members of your body that aids you and assists you in, in profitable, profitable work and gain and such, and they, they enable you to do so very much, and, but yet as valuable as they are to you, if they prohibit you or inhibit you or impede you from entering into heaven, get rid of it. It's not the hand or the eye, but rather anything in this world that would prohibit us or inhibit us from going into heaven. Get rid of it. And so we should learn to drop those things, let loose of those things that would hinder us or, or from walking in faith and walking in the light. Consider that God gave a most precious gift in order to reconcile us to him. God gave us a most precious gift. God gave all to purchase our salvation. John 3, 16, you very well know for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son to, into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Also, 1 Peter 1.18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a, of a lamb without blemish and without spot, God just didn't shell over the, the cash. He didn't give earthly gifts. Rather, he gave something so very precious to him. You think about it. As we think about our own children, how precious are they to us? We would do just about anything to ensure their well-being, to ensure that they'll go through this life well. In fact, we'll do almost anything to ensure that they will choose a life of fearing God and, and, and basically obeying the gospel and finding eternal life. And so it is God has given some giving of the most precious gift to us, that of his own, only begotten Son, and Christ shedding his own blood for us. So we see just how important we, mankind is to God. So the question is, was it easy for God to watch his only begotten Son die upon the cross? Was it easy for him to do that? Psalm 22, 1, prophesying what Jesus was going to say or what he would think upon that cross. He says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. And we know he said those very words on the cross in Matthew 27, 46, as recorded for us. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, la, lama sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus died alone, separate from his Father. That's what God gave us. He, he gave us his son to die in our stead. How important is that? How does it reflect upon God's love for us? You know, God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God wants a closer relationship with us, certainly. We were begotten of his own will, not ours. Begotten, you know, Jesus said, except thou be born anew, Except thou be born of the water and the spirit, thou shalt not see the kingdom of heaven. And as we consider that, we were, when we obeyed the gospel, we were born again as we confessed Christ, repented of our sins, and were baptized for the remission of sins. That in that burial, we died to ourselves. And, and uh, at that point, we raise up a new creature. We are begotten again of his will, not ours. James 1.18 uh, we read, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. If you draw close to, toward God, he will draw close to you. 
If you draw close to God, he will draw close to you. He wants a close relationship with us. James 4, 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Christians are adopted children. As Romans 8, 15 puts it, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You may recognize that term Abba. It's an Aramaic term of, of, uh, of uh, intimacy one would use toward his father. Jesus used that very term in Mark 14, 36. And he, as he prayed to the Father, he cried, Abba, Father. In, in, in that prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. You also consider that Christ himself wants a close relationship for us as well. It was he who reconciled us to, the, to God. And as Revelation 3.20 reveals for us, he stands at the door and knocks. If any man will open up, he will come and sup with him. So we see that God wants a close relationship with mankind. That's his desire. But bad relations with our relationships can hinder our relationship with God. That's what I've, the topic is this morning. Bad relationships with our relations will hinder our relationship with God. You consider our spiritual life can be hindered because of our problems we have with our own relationships. Having the right relationship with our spouse affects our prayer life. As 1 Peter 3, 7 puts it, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, speaking of their wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. A man can hinder his prayers by not living with his wife according to, to knowledge. Thoughtfulness. Um, knowledge according to, you know, what, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, men need to, to learn about their wives. Men need to dwell with them according to knowledge. Okay. And to the point, because if they do not, their prayer lives may very well be affected. Of course, if your prayer life is affected, <clears throat> your relationship with God is affected, and your closeness to God is affected. God expects us to forgive, thereby permitting good relationships. You know, if we will not forgive others, that's, that will sever a relationship. It will put people at a distance. And so we are taught to forgive and, and Mark 6, 14, for if you give, forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So we can see, we can put a wedge between ourselves and the Father by having an attitude of not willing to forgive others. Remember the parable of the wicked servant, Matthew 18, verses 22 through 35, where there was a, a man, a steward, who was deep in debt, and he, he went to his master to seek forgiveness for that debt. And it was that there were, there were like 10,000 talents that he owed his master. That if that were silver, that amount to over $52 million. That's a deep debt. And yet this Lord had forgiven that steward all that debt. But he went out, this, this steward who had been forgiven, he went out to someone who owed him some money, a small amount by, compar by comparison, a minuscule amount, and yet he would not forgive and had him thrown in debtor's pit of prison until all should be paid. Well, word got back to that, that Lord over him. And he called him back, said, and tell him, you know, look, I forgave you all that you, all that you owed me, and yet you would not forgive this, this small amount. And so he cast him into prison till all should be paid. And so we see, certainly, this illustrates that if we will not forgive others, whatever small amount we, that they may have uh, trespassed against us, how is it we could forgive, uh, uh, expect God to forgive us? And so we must have the attitude, just as God forgave us everything, so we too should have the attitude of forgiving others, mending relationships and retaining a close relationship with God. We should have open relationships with God and open relationships with our brethren. We don't need grudges grinding away at our conscience. In our forgiving others, we let go of things that fester in our conscience. Goodwill for others is paramount for good relationships with God. Ill will just ruins us. Let go. Keep open communications and write those things which are wronged, whatever we may have. Okay. 
So as we see that, yes, God wants a close relationship with us, but he also wants us to have close relationships with others. Jesus sets us free. Think about this. John 8, 31, he said, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Are we still in bondage? Have we put fetters on our own make, of our own making upon our own hands? Do we limit our effectiveness in our daily Christian walk because we, the, there are things that we just won't let go of? Be free. Don't be captive. You know, Satan would have us to be all wrapped up in knots with anything that would short circuits our ability to serve our God. That's his goal in life. You know, he goes about place to place as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Satan knows us very well. He knows what chains he can pull to get his response from us. You know, and so he goes about finding whom he can devour, whom he can uh, cause to stumble. And so we need to be very well of that and to realize that he would certainly delight in our ruining relationships with one, one another, thereby ruining, uh, severing, or uh, separating ourselves from God. Um, so we shouldn't let Satan have his ways with us. Rather, we should let Christ have his way with us. You consider, as God has called us out of the darkness of the world, that in our obedience to him, and our walk in faith, that we put God first. There is nothing more important in our lives than the Father. If we put God first, what does that mean then, other than we put others ahead of ourselves? In Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40, Jesus taught his disciples to serve and go the extra mile. You know, um, in Matthew 22, Jesus was asked, what, are the, what is the greatest commandment? Matthew 22, what is the greatest commandment? And let's turn there. Matthew 26, 22, verse 36. Hmm. Okay. I said that, yes. And the, the, said, the one that came to him said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. God is first. But he went on to say, This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We should love others as we love ourselves, certainly we love ourselves. So what does that tell us about a commandment? That we should love ourselves indeed. But because of we love God, we also love others like we love ourselves. And he goes on to say, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All the law and the prophets. The law of Moses was all based on loving God and loving, our, loving one's neighbor. In Matthew 5.41 and whoso shall compel thee to go a mile, let him uh, go with him twain. In the days that Jesus was speaking, it was a Roman law that, that uh, any of the, the Roman soldiers could compel anyone to carry his pack, but only as far as a mile. Okay? That was by law. If a, a Roman soldier came to you and said, you need to carry my pack for a mile, you know, he's carrying a pack is, is, uh, can be arduous after, after a period of time. So... That by law, they could say, you need to carry my pack. And Jesus said, don't just carry it one mile, carry it two. Okay. Carry it two. As we consider to leave your offering at the altar, go to your brother and make it right, in Matt, from Matthew 5, 21 through 23. We should make our lives, uh, as we consider our worship to God, and offering our, our praises and, and adoration, that we make things right with our brethren. We should have that attitude and desire to uh, make our relationships right so that our relationship with God will be open. Uh, we are to love the brethren fervently, unfeigned, without hypocrisy, as 1 Peter 1.22 states, seeing ye have purified your souls, how? In obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So as 
we have obeyed the gospel as we walk in the light, even as he is in the light, in our obedience, we have unfeigned, not faked, love of the brethren. And that we should love each other with a pure heart. Pure heart, pure motivation. And that fervently. So as our, we are being having been born again, we're not born with corruptible seed. That we're born with incorruptible. That is, the corruptible seed is like you, you plant the things uh, like corn and wheat and barley and all that in the, in the uh, soil. Of course, they grow, they mature, but they, they uh, d uh, wither and die. And that's corruptible seed. But the seed with which we're born brings eternal life. It's not corruptible. It doesn't decay. And so as the seed, the corn seed brings forth the corn plant that withers and dies, the seed of the truth of God bears its fruit of everlasting life. So we be brethren. We be friends. What kind of things would hinder our relationships with our brethren? Gossip, questioning the motives of others, all these things can affect our relationship with others. What about our pure hearts? Do we have pure motivation as we love our brethren? So we seek to build up and edify the church, which belongs to Christ. And so in doing that, it's out of a pure heart, unfeigned love of the brethren. You know, Jesus said, we will know them by their fruit. Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20. We will know others by their fruit. Particularly as he's talking, you'll know the false teachers by their fruit. They're evidence of, of the validity and truthfulness of what they're teaching by just watching what, what it, its fruits are, what it reveals. You know, we think about as we go to the grocery store and we, we uh, looking for fruit. We're inspecting. We're fruit inspectors. We look at these fruit and, we, and, and we see all the parts must be healthy. When we go, we, we, we look at the color. If it's, if it's, if it's an apple, is it, is it properly ripens? Is it red like we expect it to be? Or any other fruit, any fruit we would, we're really looking at, what are the colors? What's the smell of it? Is it? Does it smell fresh? That had no smell at all? It's too green? Or does it, is it smell like it's just been on the shelf for too long? Mold. We have to pay attention to main quality, maintain quality. You know, if there's, if there's mold in that, it, what's going to happen to that fruit if there's a little bit of mold in there? It'll turn to mush. Just prior to molding, overripe or rotten, etc. We look at all these qualities of the fruit. Is it too ripe or is it not ripe enough? What about the hard fruit? You know, think about if it's too green, it's going to be too hard. And it won't have any flavor. It's not ripe, it's still green. It's picked too early. Think about that as a hardened heart. You know, interesting correlation that, uh, that an unripened fruit very hard to the, to the touch. And so what about hardened hearts? You know, how tender is that heart? You know, any one deficiency in these fruits will affect the rest of the fruit. So in fact, one bad apple, although it doesn't spoil the whole bunch necessarily, but it can affect it in time that eventually all the apples in that bushel will, will go to rotting, will go to uh, molding. And so as we look at that, the deficiency will affect the rest of the fruit, causing the entire fruit to decay. The desire is a good taste to savor as the juices pour over our tongue. That's, that's what we're looking for, like think of a, a Georgia peach, how sweet and delectable that, that, that fruit is as we bite into that. We expect those juices to, to envelop our tongue and the sweetness pour out. We enjoy that experience. And so God desires a sweet odor, odor from us. In Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. As we consider our relationship with others, it's to edify them, not to build ourselves up, but to edify them and encourage them. As we walk in the Spirit, we will show forth the fruit of the Spirit whereby observers can judge us appropriately. You know, we aren't the only one looking around looking at fruits. Fruit, the results of one's life. Others are watching us as well. And our personal relationships will be guided by God's commands to love one another fervently, to mend broken relationships so our closeness to God will not be hindered. 
That's what we really want is a closer relationship, relationship with God. And so we want to identify those things that would separate us, divide us, um, uh, push, uh, cause us to be separated from God. You know, when mankind sinned, it turned, mankind turned its back upon God. God didn't turn his back upon mankind. And so one who is a friend of the world has made himself the enemy of God. And God, in desiring that a right relationship, a good relationship, a close relationship with mankind, reconciled us through his son, draw us back. He draws us back through the calling of the gospel. And uh, his desire is that the relationship be close, but we can hinder that by our relationships with others. So if we want a close relationship with God, and we ought, then we should also seek to mend relationships with others and try to keep them, uh, have our love for the brethren pure, unfeigned. So God does call us back to him, to rec having reconciled mankind through his son Jesus Christ, having shed his blood on the cross, that he has paid the price that we cannot pay. Because we know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We also know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, God in his desire and his grace and mercies extend his invitation to mankind to be reconciled to him again by having faith in his son Jesus Christ, confessing him as the son of God and repenting of our sins. And in our faithful, our believing obedience to him, we are all baptized for remission of sins. If you need to respond to the gospel invitation this morning, then come forward as we stand and as we sing.